welcome to Atlanta Radio's look at the latest news from around the radio world. This is the Atlanta Soundabout, and I'm Tony Sullivan. We must, of course, start with the dramatic news from Radio Caroline. The story begins several weeks back when Caroline left the air on 819 kilohertz. It was originally stated that this was due to problems with the transmitter valve. However, the true reason was that once again, the lack of finances had resulted in there being no fuel for the generators once again. Conditions on board the Ross Revenge over the last few weeks were at an all-time low. There was no heating, cooking was done by Caligas, and fresh water supplies were very low. By the start of this week, the poor conditions on board had reduced the crew on board the Ross Revenge to just three people. Caroline Martin, Chris Adams, and Rico. Food and water were getting low and supplies were being rationed. Then dramatically during the night of Monday the 10th of December, a severe northerly gale blew up with winds of up to force 10. The Ross Revenge began taking in water and the lack of generator fuel meant that the pumps could not be run. The crew were left with no option other than to abandon ship. The crew contacted the Ramsgate lifeboat by Vodafone and requested to be taken off the boat as conditions on board were hazardous. However, Ramsgate considered that there was no immediate threat to life, and as they had several other more serious calls to attend to, they refused to attend to the Ross Revenge. A further call was made from the Ross Revenge to the RAF rescue station at Manston. It is believed that around this time, the BTI came alongside the Ross Revenge and shone its searchlight at the boat. At that time, the Ross Revenge was showing no light, and the only illumination seen came from a dim torch held by one of the crew on the bridge. Eventually, at around 9.30pm, the air sea rescue helicopter was launched from Manson, and the crew were eventually winched to safety. Here's how the local radio news reported the incident on the morning of Tuesday, the 11th of December. Right around the county on this Tuesday morning, the 11th of December, it's in Victor FM. Hello. Time is now 8 o'clock, and for the latest news, around the world and local, John Brunning. Three crew members from the pirate ship Radio Caroline have been winched to safety after putting out a mayday call. Caroline Martin, Chris Adams, and Rico have spent the last few weeks rationing water and food. Last night, their power for heating and lighting failed completely. The converted trawler Ross Revenge was foundering in force eight to nine gales. In a prepared statement, a spokesman says the crew had to be brought off for their own safety. They stayed with Kent Police for some time, answering questions before finally being released. The Ross Revenge remains at anchor, riding out rather strong northeasterly winds. But for the first time, as a radio ship, she's alone. The crew on board the pirate radio ship Radio Caroline have been airlifted to safety after their vessel got into difficulties off Ramsgate last night. The Coast Guard was called after their generator failed. A lifeboat wasn't able to reach the ship because conditions were so bad, so a helicopter from RAF Manston eventually rescued the two men and a woman. Coast Guard senior watch officer Jim Lamb describes the difficult to rescue operation. Well, this is a very bad, exceptionally bad, very heavy sea, and it wasn't an easy job for, for the helicopter because of the large transmission masts aboard this vessel. So it wasn't a very nice job at all. What sort of conditions did you see in the room? Well, there's no one aboard. It's, it's a danger to navigation. And, um, you know, that's a busy sea It can be a busy sea lane. And it's flying there on the lip boat. The airlift of British hostages out of Iraq is continuing, and over 400 leave Baghdad today. A pirate radio ship abandoned off to Ramsgate is a danger to shipping. Dover Coast Guard say the Radio Caroline ship, which was abandoned last night when it got into difficulties, is now a danger to shipping in the channel. The two men and one woman crew were airlifted to safety after the generator failed in rough seas off Ramsgate. Coast Guard senior watch officer Jim Lamb says the port not anchored properly and is a serious hazard. This is Victor FM. It's 9 o'clock for the latest news now. John Brunning. The pirate ship Radio Caroline has unmanned this morning after an emergency airlift to save three crew members. Caroline Martin, Chris Adams and Rico were winched to safety by a helicopter from RAF Manston as the converted trawler sounded in force eight to nine gales. 
Conditions on board the Ross Revenge have been getting steadily worse over the past few weeks. The crew members have had no fresh water for three weeks, they were running short of food, and yesterday they lost their last stocks of petrol to power the generator. Conditions were too bad for the Coast Guard. Co-pilot on the helicopter, Jonathan Dixon, says the rescued people seemed in good spirit. They were relieved when, when, when we got them off. But a prepared statement from a Radio Caroline spokesman was less cheerful. For the first time, as a radio ship, she's alone. Kent police have questioned the three crew members. They've now been released. During the following day, Wednesday, the 12th of December, the Trinity House vessel Patricia arrived alongside the now abandoned Ross Revenge and put a team on board. They established that the vessel was empty and conditions on board were even worse than imagined. There was no fresh water, sanitation was non-existent, and the fuel level was insufficient to generate any power whatsoever. Having examined the Ross Revenge, the Trinity House team then left. HM Guards are currently putting out a regular warning to all vessels. The Ross Revenge is a hazard to navigation in the area. The Caroline organisation tried to get a crew out of the Ross Revenge, but even though the tender reached the ship, conditions meant that a boarding could not be made. A further attempt was planned. That's all the news we have from Caroline in the soundabout. However, Mark Stafford will have a full update on the very latest situation just before we close down today. Whatever happens in the next few days, it is certain that the new broadcast will mean serious problems for Caroline. Indeed, prior to the problems of the last few days, the station was in a sorry state, and even the most committed supporters were accepting that the future of the Radio Caroline as an offshore station looks bleak. The introduction of the new broadcasting bill on the 1st of January 1991 will of course not only affect Radio Caroline, it will also result in a drastic change to the world of land-based pirate radio. Whether it be one of the big commercial London pirate soul stations, or one of the small short wave stations, the broadcasting bill will mean that life after the 1st of January 1991 will never be the same. The world of land-based pirate radio in London has changed drastically over the last two decades, and as we will never again see the great days of the London pirate scene, we thought it would be appropriate to look back over some of the great London pirates in the last 20 years. Timmy Ruffins from the 60s, and I'm going to give her all the love I've got. Now, Mrs. Fox gave a call just a moment ago and said she's got a petition uh, for Radio Sovereign. If you'd like to sign that, then Mrs. Fox's number is 948-0713. If you'd like to sign her petition, add your name, 948-0713. And she'd also like to say thanks to Rob Randall and everyone Boxing Tea Party, 01647 2059 or 
it's a big gap in between the music radio jingle and the Kelly Michaels one. To do a, and this is a mess of that, I make a mistake in each program that I do. That was it. I didn't queue up the Kelly Michaels commercial. There we are. It is with much regret that due to low staffing, financial problems, and the general state of this mode of broadcasting, that Radio Commander's Scott will close down at 1 p.m. today. So our last and final hour, this Pat Edison, will be between 12 and 1. That's a movie bit over and done with. Happy track, a track that I played thousands and thousands of times on the case. Most of the time you never heard it. Sadly, those days are gone and will never return. That was Atlanta Radio's tribute to the of Pirate Radio in London. There is no doubt that in the year we'll see many battles between the London Pirate Station and the DTI. Unfortunately, the new bill will mean that there can only be one winner, and that has to be the authorities. You're tuned to Atlanta Radio. I'm Tony Sullivan, and this is the penultimate Soundabout program. In case you have not heard, Atlanta Radio will be closing in a few days' time. And our last broadcast will take place on either Sunday the 23rd of December or Boxing Day Sunday the 26th of December. In the meantime, if you would like to drop us a line, our mailing address is... Atlanta Radio, 23, South Beachwood, Edinburgh, Scotland. And the postcode, BH12. YR. We'll be back with more news on the Sandabad program after these messages. Do you remember the 1960s and the heyday of British offshore radio? Well, you can remember those golden days of the Greek British pirate era. A two and a half hour documentary from the Radio Broadcasting Library. <laughs> for the forthcoming broadcasting bill. On Sunday, the 9th of December, at approximately 12.40, Radio Atlantis closed down. Atlantis had existed as a free radio station since 1978 and as a shortwave station in various forms since 1980. The Atlantis Lads has, of course, been the organisers of the unique all-girls shortwave station, Radio Julie. In case you missed the closed down, here's how the last few minutes of Atlantis sounded. I'm going to say my goodbyes, this was the first sound to be heard on Atlantis, so he's going to be the last. And Johnny Diamond, for the very last time, it's been fun, and uh, goodbye, have fun, and don't, don't get too cold. Merry Christmas to everybody, good night from Johnny. to drop a line to the Radio 48 mailing address. 
address of a Radio 48, 23 South Beechwood, Edinburgh, EH12 5YR in Scotland. That address will be available into 1991 for your final mail to Radio 48 and all other users of this address, including, of course, ourselves here at Atlanta Radio. Lining up the other stations who will close before the 1st of January 1991, well, Sound Radio will come up at the end of December. And they have scheduled their last broadcast for December the 31st. We ourselves, here at Atlanta Radio, will be making our final broadcast during the next two weeks. The final broadcast is currently planned for Sunday the 23rd of December or Boxing Day, Sunday the 26th of December. We take a look now at events on the shortwave band over the past few weeks. On Sunday the 2nd of December, the free radio service Holland put out their long-awaited 10 years of FRSH on shortwave documentaries. They broadcast for four and a half hours on 6275 kHz. This excellent documentary is now available on the And for full details, please write to FRSH, PO Box 2727, 6049, ZG, Hurton in Holland. Don't forget, the final Atlanta Center Air program will go out during our last broadcast. It will be on the air during the next two weeks. On that program, we'll be looking back at almost 12 years of Atlanta Standard Air Program and featuring some of the familiar names from past Standard Air Programs, such as Stuart Clark and Gary Hunt. Before we finish, as always, here are a few words for our German listeners. Wir euch, wir alle beim Atlanta Radio wünschen euch alle in Deutschland eine fröhliche Weihnachten und ein gutes neues Jahr. Und ich selber, Herrn Kelvin, wünsche Ingrid Pietsch, Solveig und die Familie ein herzliches Weihnachten und Schweibbau. This is Tony Sullivan, what's your role? A very Merry Christmas. In a moment on Atlanta Radio, it's Phil Collins, followed by that final sound from the Steve program featuring Roger Twiggy Day, Kevin Turner, Tony Quinn, Carl Conway, and of course many other highlights from almost 12 years of the sounds from the Seas program. And don't forget that Mark Stafford will be bringing you the latest news concerning Caroline towards the end of this broadcast. We were sick, we were angry, 
Um, even though I knew they might do something, I didn't know they'd do this. I mean, I just, I just thought this is this is ridiculous. You know, they, 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 they can't be allowed to get away with this. Did you actually know that it was happening? I mean, from a technical point of view, I don't know whether you could hear it on your own sets on board or whatever, or whether your proximity, your own signal would interfere with that. Um, did you know immediately, or, or did it come as a shock because someone told you a few days later? No, we used to have a, a ship-to-shore link with an unnamed person on shore, obviously. Uh, they phoned up and, uh, and, and told us. So that's the first time I thought didn't know anything about it. just thought we were broadcasting, you know, they tell me, is it for all shore or not on shore? But no, it's old, and that was it, you know. Did you feel that, that perhaps it was specific to that frequency and that if you moved off 190, uh, that it might stop? Mm, not really. We had a feeling if we moved, they'd move with us. Um, because of the technical trouble to go on that, they weren't going to leave us go that easy. You know, they got the teeth into the, into the problem. Because originally the press articles show that the, um, they had said that it was uh, at the request of the Italian and Norwegian governments who presumably had ownership over that frequency. Mm. Um, did you believe that? No. <laughs> the usual propaganda of the just different words, same lies there. So, at the time, you were trying to run this station with a new format and be innovative. How did that affect what you were actually doing in your program content when you realized that people had to be listening to you over a series of bleeps? Very demoralizing, I can tell you. I mean, it's pretty demoralizing because it kept going on and off the air because it was an unreliable signal. We had trouble with the transmitters, as you know. But, uh, plus all this, I mean, I used to sit down and think, who the heck are we broadcasting to? Is anyone going to put up with that? Of course, they, they were putting up with it, and God bless them. But we didn't realize that at the time. We thought, who the heck is going to listen to that? Because radio people are great ones for thinking of what they do. Would I listen to that? And the answer probably no. But, you know, the listeners, God bless them, were, were putting up with a lot just to, to hear what they wanted to do. And I think they were, you know, so it's for that. There were still the Germans on board at this time. What was their reaction? I can't remember they were on board. If you say they were, they were. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, they didn't last very long if they were there. They soon uh, beetled off and it became an all-English service, you know. <laughs> now, there was several moves of frequency. Um, you moved to 217 meters and you moved the FM to 100 megahertz. Um, then the jamming restarted. Oh, then you moved to 244 and the jamming restarted on that frequency at the request of Czechoslovakia. Uh, what was the feeling about what you could do about this? What, did you want to move back to the Dutch coast? Did you suggest that? No, I did suggest that, but, uh, but you know, that was my uh, cold ear, shall we say. <laughs> the previous suggestion had been met with, they seemed to think they knew it all in that way, but uh, no, I just thought it was, once they started, it weren't going to stop, no matter what happened. They had the excuse. No, they were sticking with it. Yeah. Now, um, an election was called a general election for the 18th of June that year. Uh, at the time, there had been a s frequent switching of signal in the days before, I believe, switching signal every hour to try and get away from the jamming signal. It always followed within about 15 minutes. Now, when the election was called, there was a decision for our United campaign on behalf of the Conservative Party. How did you feel about that? I thought it was our only hope. Um, I'm a great believer that radio stations shouldn't be political, but we've been forced into it um, by undemocratic methods, so perhaps we're being undemocratic in plugging the Conservative Party, but uh, uh, a dying man grabs any straw, um, and we knew the only way we were going to have any chance of surviving was maybe, if this was a Conservative government, we would be allowed to continue, and the jamming would be uh, stopped. Um, we certainly we knew that uh, part of the manifesto for the Conservatives to introduce commercial radio. So, well, that was a good enough reason anyway. So we just reminded the audience of the party that was in favour of commercial radio. We also reminded them of the party that had passed the Marine Offences Act and in theory closed down stations so much loved all around the country. So uh, although it's not in theory what a radio station should be into, for survival, very necessary. Caroline International. Oh, don't forget this rally to be held this Sunday, tomorrow, on June the 14th at 3 o'clock down at London's Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park and protest against the jamming of free radio stations. Appearing at the rally will be several well-known names from the show business world and also several guest celebrities. The rally will be followed by a
Square March on number 10 Downing Street, and Lincoln will be past that on the way. And Radio Caroline has had 500 pounds for half a million of these printed, and also posters will be available to hand out during the course of this election week. And contact your friends, tell at least 10 of them to go down. If everybody did that, well, we'd have thousands of people down at Speaker's Corner tomorrow afternoon, which we want. And special programs will be running from Caroline tomorrow afternoon from about 2.30 onwards for all our people down at... Hyde Park, Speaker's Corner. So make sure you're tuned into Caroline tomorrow afternoon. And above all, make sure that you're down at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. It's a rally for freedom. And also, if you can make... Make autographs, well, make sure you take your autograph book with you because there'll be plenty, and believe me, when I say plenty, there'll be plenty of well-known celebrities down at the rally. So make sure you're there. And From the offshore era of over 20 years ago to the recent past now, in January 1990, we talked to Chris Cooper, who had just returned from a spell on the Ross Revenge. And he gave us a quick rundown of how the Caroline studio looked at Christmas 1989. Well, the studio, uh, well, centerpiece is... Um a fairly basic eight-channel mixer, uh, but it does the job. That's the main thing. It's made by Dan. Um, on it just runs through through the channels really. On on channel one, you've got uh, the main microphone, which is an AKG. Uh, channel two is uh, a Yoko, whoever they are. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, what do people uh, find that amusing? Um, that's a six CD player. Um, channel. Three, I don't think he's using that. I'm trying to do this from memory. Four and five of the uh, gate record decks, which are very old, but very twisty, and uh, certainly gave no trouble when I was there. Uh, then there's uh, a couple of cart machines, which which did give trouble. Uh, one cart machine doesn't work at all. The other one was a little bit sentimental, although uh, at the time I left the station, they were still arguing about whether it was a cart machine that was faulty or whether we'd actually got a faulty batch of carts. And it now seems to be probably the latter. So uh, hopefully we'll be getting the the cart machine working soon and getting the bowl hanging out on the top of the air. And then um, I think that's it for the second of the phasers. And the eighth fader is the um, Sony uh, cassette deck, which in the absence of working cart machines has been used for playing uh, all the commercials and uh, promos at the moment. And uh, following on the, the technical side, well, um, one of the things I know having talked to you before that you think is is missing from at the moment is some sort of audio processing described to me uh, the, the, the home-built, uh, home-brew audio processing that is on board at the moment. <laughs> That's right, yes, Mark. It's um, very, very simple audio processing. It's sort of one circuit board about which measures sort of like six inches by three inches with a couple of dozen components on it. And that just sits on the floor, literally. Uh, it's not in a box or anything, just uh, a circuit board sitting on the floor in the transmitter room. And that handles all the audio processing. Um, apart from the signal sounding a little bit bassy at the moment, I, I don't think there's too much wrong with it. It's got a, a, a fairly acceptable frequency response, considering we are talking about uh, AM quality. Uh, but of course, it, it hasn't got that loudness, that sort of punchiness that you, you'd get with an Optimod or, or some sort of sophisticated signal processor like that. So uh, hopefully, one day then you'll get uh, decent processing out there. And uh, coming on to my talking technical again, um, can, we, can we talk transmitters? Because I know you've got an interesting story about uh, self-driving the valve from, <laughs> from from out on land, out to sea. You you, you sort of uh, slept on a valve or something, didn't you? <laughs> yes, uh, I was uh, in, entrusted with this one um, fairly ordinary looking cardboard box. And they said, God, this was your life. And when I found out it cost about £600, I thought, well, it's probably worth more than my life. So I, d I did look after it quite well. Um, but uh, that was one of five or six new uh, output valves which um, arrived on the ship uh, in the latter half of um, December 1989 and were fitted um, in the first few days of the uh, new year. I think something like four of them have, have been used, um, which leaves us with one spare. And um, they're, they're quite sort of... I don't know how to describe this, or that big, if you can see what I mean. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and quite heavy. Chris Cooper from the January 1990s Sounds from the Sea program, forgetting that you can't see sign language on the radio. It's time to go back into the archives now. In 1981, we interviewed Martin Kane. Here he is talking about his days on Caroline North in 1967. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we found the track where she swears. She probably swears on the other track as well. Uh, that's called Troy, not the value of ignorance. 
and uh, the value of ignorance. Is he ever live, Chaton B? It's from three babies. A good, uh, good value for money, that is, considering uh, I got it at extremely, um, well, a competitive rate. I think, a competitive rate. Now, just to repeat the problems we've been having with our 11-metre transmitter, uh, there's been many technical problems. In fact, a minor technical problem with it. We're trying to uh, eradicate that, and hopefully uh, the 11-metre will be on for extended hours over Christmas this year, so if we've resolved the problem, uh, the 11-metre transmitter on 25.920 megacycles, I think, will be on extended hours, possibly with a loop tape at some period, and also live and taped programmes going out worldwide over the Christmas period period on 25920, so uh, check it out, yo, yo. Uh, the sad news is, uh, I'd say, uh, UK looks like uh, the local station on medium wave and FM sites can be found, uh, that there will be any transmissions from UK over the Christmas period. Um, there's been, uh, again, not so much technical problems, but other problems um, with various people. Uh, so it looks well, unfortunately, like UK will not be on the air over Christmas at the present time, but uh, uh, that uh, has been subject to change, but we've got to, uh, I think, uh, prepare the listeners in the West Midlands for the year. And now, uh, Bruce Dickinson, and he doesn't want to be a tattooed millionaire. Day, Wednesday, the 12th of December, the Trinity House vessel Patricia arrived alongside the now abandoned Ross Revenge and put a team on board. They established that the vessel was empty and conditions on board were even worse than imagined. There was no fresh water, sanitation was non existent, and the fuel level was insufficient to generate any power whatsoever. Having examined the House Revenge, the Trinity House team then left. HM Coast Guards are currently putting out a regular warning to all vessels that the Lost Revenge is a hazard to navigation in the area. The Caroline organisation tried to get a crew out of the Lost Revenge, but even though the tender reached the ship, conditions meant that a boarding could not be made. A further attempt was planned. That's all the news we have from Caroline in the standabout. However, Mark Stafford will have a full update on the very latest situation just before we close down today. And here we are, Mark Stafford with a full update on the Caroline situation. We've just heard Tony Sullivan's version of the news as at about uh, Wednesday night, updating it now as at uh, the early part of the weekend. The situation is that since the news we gave you, um, the Caroline organisation got a boat out there on about Thursday, and uh, the boat could not get somebody on board due to the rough work weather. But later in the week, a successful attempt was made, and the latest news that we have is that Peter Chicago is now on board Russ Revenge. I'm not sure, can't seem to establish whether he's on his own or whether he has somebody with him. One way or another, we wish him all the best. If the weather turns rough, we will be a very brave man. And just to give you a recap on how things are in general, the conditions on board up here are terrible. Probably the worst things have been, well, by far I'd say the worst things have been. Forget about the 1970s and 78, 79 winter when it was supposed to be very bad. We're talking here about uh, no heating, no lighting, a little bit of fuel, a real struggle and um, a pretty awful place to be, so send your Christmas wishes out to Peter Chicago. Anyway, here's some music that uh, ex-Caroline DJ friend of mine, Chris Cooper, brought back to me once. <laughs> brought this uh, record back uh, on the tape of it and said, uh, this is something to do with uh, Pirate Radio. In fact, it's a record that Caroline used to play about the winter of 89. These are the Hooters. And let's hope this is true. Give the music back. The pirate ship is crushing through the waves, sending the signal out of ballad to the brave. Those are the words, those are the Hooters. Last time I played that record, a couple of people said, what was it? And uh, where can we get it? It is the Hooters, it's on their album Zigzag, and it's called Give the Music Back. I made my Chris Cooper used to play that to finish off his show on Caroline when he was out there last Christmas. Last Christmas, of course, a happier time than this Christmas on Caroline, but it is Christmas time, so let's keep that spirit up. Here's one that takes me back. Oh, 1972, the Christmas of 72. This is Tony Ashton and Celebration on Purple Records and Tape. <laughs> Getting a full on this one. Two and a 48 minutes. You should find.
Blinders on a second pregnancy. That is Tony Ashton from Christmas 1972 and uh, celebration. I'm a little bit disorganised, I have to own up and say that I am a little bit disorganised at the moment because I was hoping to pick you out a recording from Christmas 72 and play it for you, but I had it all lined up earlier this morning. Uh, so many things have happened in between and total chaos is ruling at the moment, but it is Christmas, so I suppose we'll add that. Also, amongst the chaos, I've lost a big list of dedications. Had about a page worth of uh, dedications and names from our November broadcast for people who wrote in. So somewhere that's gone missing. <laughs> in the meantime, I think what we'll do is... Uh, read those out on the final broadcast of Atlanta Radio. One more broadcast to come, that will either be the 23rd or the 26th of December, one of those two days. One day, one day. No, uh, for the November broadcast. Atlanta Radio 23 South Beach with Edinburgh, Scotland. That is the uh, mailing address here at Atlanta Radio. The H12-5YR, if you'd like to help the postman in this uh, busy run up to Christmas, I'm sure the postcode will help him a little bit. And that mailing address will be open past the end of the year, so don't worry about your mail not reaching us by the end of the year. We'll be able to receive it even if it comes in uh, in early January. Right, earlier this morning I played my favourite three singles from 1990. I demand a recount, because this really should have been in my favourite uh, list of singles for the year. From earlier this year, They Might Be Giants. Do you remember They Might Be Giants? This one, Bird Eyes in Your Soul. Atlanta Radio, 23 South Beachwood, Edinburgh, Scotland, EH 125 YR. You have been listening to Atlanta Radio this morning. One more broadcast to go. We'll be closing down on that final broadcast. Mark Stafford, Phil Collins, and Tony Sullivan, and the engineers, of course. I'd like to say, have a great Christmas. We may just speak to you before, but have a great Christmas anyway, just in case we don't. By the way, don't forget uh, the Free Radio Service Holland Christmas Special uh, Christmas broadcast coming up on the uh, 23rd of December on 7490 kilohertz for about four hours or so. 7490 kilohertz for the Free Radio Service Holland. Of course, listen round over Christmas time. It is a time for uh, pirate radio stations to appear on short road. One or two surprises may happen on Christmas Day or Boxing Day. Atlanta Radio is closing down in just a moment and we'll finish with uh, something nice and smoochy for Christmas. Have a great Christmas.
Welcome to Atlanta Radio's look at the latest news from around the radio world. This is the Atlanta Soundabout, and I'm Tony Sullivan.